what to do with beauty or joy or for that matter in the midst of tragedy of violence of cruelty asks my friend and colleague the Reverend Karen Johnston what do we do with the living Give each their due, do not lose ourselves in any of it, but find ourselves anew. Where there is beauty, amplify it. Where beauty is hidden, reveal it. Where beauty is ruined, restore it. Where beauty is absent, create it. This will be our gift to our aching world. My friends, our aching world needs us to amplify, reveal, restore, and create beauty. It wants us to be aware of and grateful for all the beauty surrounding us. It's everywhere, in nature, in our beings, in our creations, as well as in the many vibrant colors, smells, textures, and sounds surrounding us. Our aching world needs beauty to offer balance to the many painful things that are going on. It wishes for us to be nurtured by beauty so that we can bring more light collectively into this broken world. In his beautiful book, the Invisible Embrace Beauty. One of my favorite poets, the poet John O'Donohue, says that in a sense, all the contemporary crises can be reduced to a crisis about the nature of beauty. It is because we have so disastrously neglected the beautiful that we now find ourselves in such terrible crisis. O'Donoghue asks us how much ugliness we want to endure and allow. The climate crisis comes from our lack of willingness to value and honor beauty, he says. The Reverend Sean Parker Dennison agrees with him. The ability to see beauty is the beginning of our moral sensibility. What we believe is beautiful, we will not wantonly destroy, he asserts. And our stress and emptiness inside can be traced to our lack of attention to beauty. We lose meaning and hope in life, O'Donoghue reminds us, when our minds remain unvisited by images and thoughts which hold the radiance of beauty. In turning away from beauty, he says, we turn away from all that is wholesome and true and deliver ourselves into an exile where the vulgar and artificial dull and deaden the human spirit. But he warns us, beauty is not to be confused with glamour or surface appearances. What the media, fashion world, and Hollywood elevate as beauty is more to do with glamour and commercialism and passing trends. No true beauty lifts the soul. It elevates our lives. As O'Donoghue says, the beautiful offers us an invitation to order, to coherence and unity. And when these needs are met, the soul feels at home in the world. So it seems to me a matter of utmost spiritual importance that we nourish our souls with beauty, doesn't it? Yes? <laughs> I have live people here. Please respond. <laughs> I've had two years of no response. It makes the biggest difference when, when you act alive <laughs> in your beauty. <laughs> On a recent evening, after seeing another graphic, painful story about what's going on in the Ukraine, I found myself feeling really hopeful about the human condition. I'm hopeless, I'm sorry. Hopeless about the human condition. I felt helpless to alleviate this tremendous 
human suffering to stop this senseless violence that is harming millions. Now, sure, I've given money to help those in need, but I've been wanting to do more while feeling so useless to, to make some kind of change. So I took out my cup of tea into my backyard, because I'm from England and we drink tea, and I had the blessing of sitting in my garden, and I want to show you a few pictures of my garden. There's the Buddha and Kuan Yin there. Feeling the breeze on my cheeks, I watched hummingbirds drink nectar from colorful blossoms, yellow butterflies fluttering all around and bees busy pollinating. And I admired the beautiful yellow rose that you all gave me last year for final fellowship, which is prime in the middle of my garden, blossoming now. And I listened to the birds singing joyously and the wind chime ringing its calming tones. And I saw water bubbling in my chalice fountain as birds gratefully washed and drank from it. And as I relaxed into this beauty, my heart ached, wanting more than anything to be able to end the many atrocities going on around the world. And though I felt helpless, I remembered that part of my duty is to keep holding the light to keep finding the positive, keep lifting up that which is beautiful, to counterbalance all the pain in the world. Part of my responsibility is to do what our chalice reminds us about every week, which is to shine a light, to lift up that which is hopeful, beautiful, and good as a beacon in dark times. In fact, that is how our chalice imagery began, after all, offering safety and light amidst the atrocities of Nazi Germany. The writer Anne Lamott asks us, how does us appreciating spring help the people of Ukraine? If we believe in chaos theory and the butterfly effect, that the flapping of a monarch's wings near my home can lead to a weather change in Tokyo, then maybe noticing beauty, flapping our wings with amazement, changes things in ways we cannot even begin to imagine. It means goodness is quantum. Even to help the small world helps. Even prayer, which for some seems to do nothing, she writes, everything is connected. And then the Reverend Karen Johnson reminds us, where there is beauty, amplify it. Now, the default mode network in our brains wires us to look for what's wrong and what's scary and what's worrying for us in the world. Like all animals, we're programmed to check for threats, that, things that might upset us, to ensure our survival. And it's an important instinct that helps us protect and extend our life. But in modern day times, my friends, when most of us are not subject to daily threats on our lives, sometimes that default mode network can leave us focusing too much on the negative and have us miss the beauty that is all around us at all times. Instead, we need to train ourselves to look for what's good and beautiful and sacred. We need to amplify what's beautiful, to bring light into the world. And we do that by savoring good experiences, by really noticing all the beauty around us. So I invite you to take a moment now and look around you. Find something that catches your eye, that is beautiful in your environment, whether you're here in the sanctuary or at home. Whether it's the colors or the nature outside the window or the candle lit in our midst or the slide on the screen, which is in Glacier National Park in Montana. Or whether it's something in your home environment, anything that you find beautiful, peaceful or joyful to look at. And if you have visual challenges or can't see anything in your immediate environment, I invite you to picture something beautiful in your mind's eye and start exploring that. And now, savor it. Oh, I'm looking at that slide. Savor it. Examine it more closely. Start noticing its nuances, its shapes and textures. How is the light playing on it? 
What kinds of colors do you see? Then I invite you to breathe in its beauty. Let its luminosity fill your heart. How does focusing on this beauty make your body feel? And then breathe it in some more. My friends, savoring is so important because negative experiences, as we know, can stick to our brain like Velcro and go round and round and round. Now, that survival tactic helps us remain alert to potential danger, but if we think about it, we usually experience more positive than negative experiences in a day. Yet, unfortunately, positive experiences tend to slide off us like water down a slide. The way we make positive experiences stick is actually by savoring them. So if we stop and really take them in for even as little as 10 seconds, it supposedly activates the section of our brain that stores happiness. And more happiness means we get to shine our light more brightly in this world. And if you take my picture off the screen, that would be even better. <laughs> I don't need to double, triple shine the light, I don't think. <laughs> So whatever beautiful things, my friends, that we've been focusing on, let's really stop and breathe it in for at least 10 seconds, things that bring us joy and that evoke beauty so that we can start programming our brains to hold that foremost. The Reverend Johnson also reminds us where beauty is hidden, reveal it. Now, there's a story about a giant gray clay statue of a Buddha in Bangkok, Thailand, in the mid-1950s. And this ordinary-looking yet popular statue started to crack and peel from years of heat and drought. And then one day, the monks had to move the statue from a, into a different room, and a part of it actually broke off. And when the monks went to investigate the damage, they shone their flashlight into the cracks and they were astonished to find something glimmering back at them from inside the cracks. And then they discovered that beneath the gray clay there was gold. And it turns out that a solid gold statue, this Buddha, had been covered by gray plaster and clay for 600 years to keep it safe from marauding armies who would have melted it down and stolen it. So the monks assured its survival by hiding its gold. But beneath its drab exterior, there was a glorious, luminous golden Buddha. And in fact, you can visit this Buddha in its full golden glory at Wat Trimit Temple in Bangkok. Now, my friends, we sometimes do that with the beauty within us, don't we? Don't we? We cover it with a protective shell to keep us safe from the judgments and oppressions and challenges that life presents. And we bury our beauty beneath fear or anxiety or confusion. And these layers of protection are often important, but they mean that we may never get to see the gold, the beauty within us. And we all have it, our radiant, beautiful selves but if we keep them covered up, they may never get to emerge from behind the facade. So I invite us to shine our flashlight into the cracks of our facade, even quietly every now and then, more if you dare, to reveal the gold within us. Allow the beauty within us to shine forth. And one of the ways to help us reveal that beauty is through daily practices. Daily practices that bring us joy, or peace, or a sense of belonging. You might wish to meditate, or pray, or walk in nature. Do something that allows you to peel back the layers of fear and anxiety, or the places where perhaps you felt frozen or walled off inside. Now, you know you hear me talk a lot about the benefits of meditation, but I really believe that it can help us train our minds to get away from the reactive, speedy, fight-or-flight instinct that protects our outer shell. 
to allow for more of our authenticity and peace to shine forth. By the way, I have to just share with you, today's a really important day for me because I mark the milestone of meditating 1,000 consecutive days in a row, and that was taken this morning on my cell phone. <laughs> and I can attest it really has made a huge difference in my life. And this daily meditating has been inspired by a commitment to keep refocusing my mind on that which is beautiful and good. A commitment to do my part in lessen, lessening suffering in this world. And I do believe it is allowing more of my inner beauty to shine forth, and I'm grateful for that. And the Reverend Johnson also reminds us where beauty is ruined, because of course that happens in many of our lives, restore it. We can restore it. Beauty can be restored even in the most broken devastated places. Here are some pictures of the ghost town around Chernobyl, where the nuclear reactor melted down in 1986. And you can see the before picture and then what it looks like now. The surrounding areas were abandoned as a nuclear wasteland. And now new nature has reclaimed them and created a beautiful new reality. Likewise, in our lives, where our beauty has been damaged or hurt, given some peace, compassion, and nurturance, we can encourage it to regrow. We can encourage it to restore. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Japanese art of kintsugi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's kintsugi. And rather than throwing away broken pottery, as we are so wont to do in our disposable American culture, the Japanese custom of kintsugi invites us to repair and restore beauty. And they glue the broken pieces together with lacquer mixed with gold, silver, or platinum so that the breaks become beautiful joins and it becomes a new work of art. Breakage and repair becomes part of the history and beauty of the object, rather than something to disguise or discard. And this expresses the Japanese philosophy of Mushin, or no mind, which emphasizes non-attachment, equanimity, and the acceptance of change as normal aspects of human life. So when we look at our broken parts as elements that can be knitted together by something beautiful, they too can transform and shine anew. Finally, the Reverend Johnston invites us where beauty is absent, create it. We need creativity. We need art to open our hearts to the sublime, just like that girl did in the story earlier. Creating beauty can be a protest to the ugliness around. In a time of destruction, create something, a poem, a parade, a community, a school, a vow, a moral principle, one peaceful moment, writes Maxine Hong Kingston. Create something, generate something beautiful. Creativity is an expression of beauty, from making art to dancing, to writing poetry, to knitting or kneading clay. Make something beautiful, anything. Put more beauty into this world. Beauty is love expressed through creativity. And as I look out upon you here, I know so many of you do that. And it just creates more loveliness for us all. Beauty is love expressed through creativity. Beauty heals the ugliness. Creating beauty is a way of counterbalancing all the pain. So I invite you to think about what gifts of beauty you might create to sweeten this world. Anthony gives us the gift of beautiful music every week. And I want to add one more element to Reverend Johnson's call to amplify, reveal, restore, and create beauty by reminding us of the power of gratitude. When we practice gratitude for all that's beautiful, we intentionally shift our attention from what's wrong 
towards what's beautiful and good in our lives. And practicing gratitude when we wake up and when we go to sleep helps us remember all the many good things that are occurring during the day as, to, as opposed to focusing on the things that we struggle with or that were hard in the day. Now, it's easy to get acclimated to our day-to-day and start taking it for granted and forget the beauty and goodness all around us. And we may focus on the threats rather than what's good. And sometimes it can feel like there's nothing new here in this life. So, my friends, I invite us to get intentional about noticing the beauty and good all around us as a practice. Are you game to try this? Wonderful. Wonderful. Yesterday, I was struggling a little when I woke up, and so I sat and began thinking of a few things that I was grateful for. And then I continued my meditation by simply repeating the words, thank you, thank you, as a mantra over and over again. Thank you. Gratitude can help us transform even difficult times, even when it's hard to find things that we're grateful for. And just repeating thank you Thank you can bring you into that space. And it also transforms neutral or ordinary experiences into something that we can savor. So before we close today with an iconic video of gratitude for this beautiful word, I want to, world, I want to leave you with more words by John O'Donohue. Beauty is not just a call to growth. It is a transforming presence wherein we unfold towards growth almost before we realize it. Our deepest self-knowledge unfolds as we are embraced by beauty. My friends, may we be nurtured by beauty to help us balance difficult times. May we seek to amplify, reveal, Restore and create beauty while always remembering the power of gratitude to uplift this beautiful world we've been given.